I'm director of UNITAS Division for Prosperity. Uh, welcome. It's wonderful to see you. see you all. Thank you so much for coming. We tried our best to, to talk with the weather, uh, trying to make it beautiful and sunny like yesterday, <laughs> but unfortunately, um, they, they don't listen to me. <laughs> but we are inside, but we have beautiful view. Um, so, uh, welcome to UNITA's uh, workshop, AI Innovations for Sustainable Development. And we have uh, people from many different communities today. Uh, we have um, distinguished board members of UNITA's Division for Prosperity Program Advisory Board. Thank you so much for coming. We also have guests from uh, UN Permanent Missions. Thank you very much. And we know that we also have representatives from academia, private sector, civil society organization, different communities. So uh, we are very, very excited to have you all here. Thank you so, so much. Technological advancement is remarkable. Um, robotics, digital technology, AI, which we are, go we are going to focus on. For example, recently I went to this restaurant close to this, uh, this office, Chinese restaurant, and there I saw a robot serving food. <laughs> Remarkable techno technology advancement. And also, you know, every part of our life, we have been working with, you know, AI already, uh, if you know it or not. So uh, digital technologies and AI could help us achieve all areas of sustainable development, accelerate sustainable development. Simultaneously, we all know that there are challenges, uh, risks associated with AI and digital technologies. So what is important for us is to make sure we embrace these opportunities. Simultaneously, we continue to be aware of these challenges and making sure that we will use it to achieve sustainable future, not exacerbate uh, division or inequality. So that's that's why we are here. We are here to listen to our expert, AI expert. We are very delighted to have Vedan Aluwalian. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Brilliant. <laughs> so uh, um, Vedan has been working with us for some time. He's an outstanding AI expert. So we will listen, we will learn from him, but simultaneously we hope to make today's session as interact, interactive as possible. So we are here to talk, brainstorm, and think creative and innovative solutions to achieve sustainable development goals. So we are counting on every one of you. Um, that's all from, from my side. And uh, uh, lastly, I would also like to thank uh, Unita colleagues who have been working day and night to make this uh, event successful. So thank you very much to all the Unita colleagues. Thank you. Now I would like to give the floor to uh, United Nations Assistant Secretary General and also Unita's Executive Director, Mr. Nikhil Seth, for his opening uh, welcome remarks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mihoko. I'm very impressed that you managed to have such a robust side event interspersed with a meeting of the advisory board on the prosperity development taking place very soon. And to thank you all for being here and part of this discussion. Artificial intelligence and what it's going to mean to the world wavers between deep pessimism and deep optimism and deep hope. Only yesterday I was reading the Guardian Weekly, an article by Noval Hari, very pessimistic, very portending deep problems for humanity if we continue the growth of artificial intelligence, unbridled, without any guardrails, where even companies don't know what their experts are doing in the progress of this technology. So they are very, and I also, uh, I forget the name of the scientist, 
so-called father of artificial intelligence. And he was giving an interview where he said, eternal life, thanks to AI and its applications, is round the corner. And eternal life will also mean that we are going to be plugged in. Our brains are going to be plugged in, in the cloud. Very uh, matrix-like predictions <laughs> that we will end up pursuing happiness in this virtual world that we can inhabit forever. So rather stark descriptions of where AI and its applications and the advances of technology can lead us. But on the other hand, we hear so much about artificial intelligence for good, the utilization of artificial intelligence for progress in all of our sustainable development goals, in its application to climate change, in the applications to progress on so many of the other uh, sustainable development goals, that one gets confused sometimes. How do you reach a balance? How do you use artificial intelligence for all the things that we want to use it without coming to this doomsday scenario where the applications, the misapplications, I would say, of AI, and one which is uh, sort of explored a lot in the news, particularly in this year when we have a record number of elections, is misinformation, disinformation, how it distorts the institutions that we revel in democracies and how it changes every institution that we've spent 100 years in creating. Will it distort this completely, the misinformation, disinformation side? And then, of course, we look at the negatives around hybrid war, on autonomous lethal weapons, on the dangers it poses to the risk of an unintended nuclear holocaust. So there's so much that we need to understand, setting up of the guardrails around the development and growth out of artificial intelligence, in my mind, is clearly one of the big missions that the UN has to do. But I'm getting diverted from your mission. Your mission is to understand the potential and see what are its applications. UNITAR has been pioneering in some of its applications. Our satellite division, you know, Saturn's called, has done the applications of artificial intelligence in machine learning, for example. Uh, they used to, I knew them 10 years ago, when they used to manually count the movement of people, the number of refugee camps, and so on. But now it's done automatically by the machine. It's machine learning. They can tell you estimates of the number of people on the move, the number of people living, living in refugee camps, the location of refugee camps, and so on. They've also done tremendous applications in the world, field of water, in flood water, flood forecasting, and the dashboards they've developed have been of great use to many countries. Of course, they tell me that it's still work in progress. Flood forecasting is still not a perfect art, but the ability of using artificial intelligence in making all this a little more accurate seems to be uh, round the corner. And of course, what I want you to focus or so on as you think of artificial intelligence is where are these developments taking place? Which are the sectors which are powering the growth of artificial intelligence? Is it the, only the trillion dollar big companies, especially in the United States? What is happening in China? How can we harness some of this for the global good? Maybe they are not motivated as much as we are as part of the United Nations system on the common good and the global good. They are motivated by several other things, the defense industry, strategic uh, concerns, which guide the growth of technology and artificial intelligence are very strong. Uh, the uh, businesses are looking to expand their reach uh, and the footprint of these companies. So their primary motivations are sometimes different from what we in the U UN want to achieve. We want a better world. We want reduced climate risks. We want more sustainable environment. We want empowerment of women. We want elimination of poverty. How is artificial intelligence going to help us to come to a world of greater equality, of a more sustainable future? That's what we need to focus on. So engage in this with curiosity. 
Remember that it was curiosity in the first place which got us in technology to where we are. And it's your curiosity on applying all this for the purposes and the values and the goals of the United Nations that will make its applications even better. So with that, I leave you to your in-depth discussions. I hope you have a rewarding day. Please remember the word curiosity and keep asking questions because a lot of young people with Antha has been doing a lot of this. He uh, learned it all, I believe, in Stanford, and then he's applied it to many fields in India, including health and agriculture and water. Let's learn from each other and to see how can we apply it in our own work, in the spheres we can influence and all. So I wish you a lovely day. And uh, you have two panels to do, I understand. In the afternoon, uh, yes. They're more specific, but I gave you a broader overview because I know AI can be confusing, and the greater clarity you get on its applications, the better it works. So thank you, and have a great day. Thank you so much, Nikhil. So now we are starting the workshop, and I'd like to give the floor to our expert for today. We're done. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks so for the, the great uh, encouragement for everyone to start uh, learning more about AI and really moving in that direction. Because one thing I strongly feel about is that this technology has changed the world. A few years ago, we could never think a car can drive on its own. It was not even in our view of imagination in 2010, 2011, no matter how advanced technology was, nobody would have imagined a car could ever drive on its own, but by 2016, it was. All credit goes to the AI brain technology that was built to mimic our thinking, how do we drive and create that in a technological system. And that really changed the way of the world. And we had such innovations possible that were never possible before. The Google eye glasses that can see your eyes and tell you if you'll get a heart attack in the next five years. That level of precision, even doctors don't have today, but AI can provide that to you. So with the technology so powerful, there's no reason we should not achieve the SDGs even faster, even better, and even more comprehensive manner. Of course, uh, chat GPT is what has really read, uh, led to everyone that AI is here. Before that, there was a lot of AI, but it was in small pockets. But the main commercial application to customers is chat GPT, and it's the fastest $100 billion company in the world. Nobody, most people would have not heard of Sam Altman about seven years ago. And now there's probably not a person that has not heard of him in this time after creating the AI. That's the power of AI. And that's the impact it can have. One company in a small place can change the world. And that's something that uh, we all should really champion, bring that as part of all our activities, and really move forward in a direction that's better for all with this technology, because it'll help us achieve. I was actually talking to Mihoko yesterday. She mentioned that uh, electricity consumption of AI is actually a very big question, which is contributing to climate uh, change and causing bigger problems. But that, again, is a problem that AI itself will solve. The NVIDIA founder has recently said that there's not a chip we can build without AI. The dependency on AI is growing over and over because its level of understanding data, understanding the world around us, understanding us as humans is unprecedented. It can understand it way better than us. We spent 100 years to gather all the data on physics, make these experiments, try to come up with our understanding of the world. But AI can do that in a matter of months. With the right data, even monitoring uh, galaxies, it can understand the underlying working of different galaxies, which we have been dreaming of for a long time. So it's giving us great power, great power to move forward. Of course, it should be used in the right way. Every technology that's come has a positive and a negative. The person that invented the bomb didn't make it for violence. He made it for progress. And similarly, nuclear energy and other technologies that have come in have come in for the greater good. And it's us, humans, who need to ensure the technology is used for the positive. Because technologies can be used for anything. It's, it's not, it doesn't think for its own. We train it on what to think and what to do. So it's our overall responsibility to ensure it's used for the best for everyone. So this presentation today, we're going to focus on um, an SDG lens but also kind of demystify what is AI, because currently there's a very big connection between technology and AI, where I want to kind of demark both aspects. Normally when there's a software role, it's called a software developer. When there's an AI role, it's an AI researcher or scientist. So there's a very stark difference between the two. The code that you need to build AI is available. You can get it from ChatGPT, you can get the code for software development from ChatGPT, but building intelligence in the system, 
is a skill that's the much needed skill of the future. And that's where a lot of countries are lacking. They're able to build something, but that something doesn't work at the level of where Google, Microsoft, and other companies are doing it. So that is actually the skill of AI. And if uh, we claim that coding is, uh, you know, AI is the same thing, then so biology is English, right? It's the same skill. So that's where there's a stark difference and realizing that kind of takes us forward. Uh, could we go to the next slide, Isam? So this is our background, done a few things in the world. I was also part of Obama's team early on when we were working on AI and nanobots in 2013, quite a few things back in the day. And then it became more and more present and 10 years it took, but now Google is claiming by 2030 will be immortal, which was another point that, that Nikhil mentioned. And nanobots are basically nanoscale robots that we're able to inject in the bloodstream that are harmless, that can really provide personalized medicine at the pinpointed location where it's needed. And that helps us without side effects to achieve treatments, preventive treatments where healthcare starts happening before you get sick. So in the future, where, which is coming and we'll show the healthcare video also just to give you an idea, is where uh, people will not have diseases. We will predict the disease before it happens and cure you before you actually have the disease. So your life fulfillment is at, at a much bigger, much better level. And also the medical fulfillment where medical industry needs patients, needs people to come to the industry sustains, they sustain on the preventive side, which ensures this a greater world for everyone and people enjoy a better success. Uh, Hassan, can we play that uh, the personalized medicine video? I, I just shared it with them just to give you some uh, perspective and visuals on that as we move forward. Yeah. While he plays the video, I hope you all have had a great morning so far and <laughs> enjoying it. So we'll be keeping the session more interactive, really involving you all at a certain point. Uh, once we go over what SDGs have been using AI to achieve better results, we'll want you all also to, as groups, work on what AI you think can apply to your area of interest or the area of SDG you're working on. And eventually, once we show you a strategy of how to apply AI in an SDG, we'll want you to work out a strategy of how you think you can bring AI into your area of work to really create the change because the idea is not just to share knowledge, it's to share knowledge and concrete actionable steps so that this can really move forward our progress faster. We've set a timeline 2030, India set a timeline 2047, but if we achieve it earlier with AI, it's even better. And a lot of countries have started moving in the direction, making different transformations. Incorporating it has always resulted in better results, but the strategy needs to be concrete, correct, and all the details that underlie in its deployment need to be understood better. Are we there? Oh, no, not this one, the other one, right? This one's more about the job roles. Do we have it? It says personalized, yeah. For possible in surgery. It's an extension of our own eyes, allowing us to see in three dimensions. It's an extension of our own hands, allowing us to perform sophisticated surgeries through incisions the size of a finger. Cleveland Clinic has a long history of advanced minimally invasive and robotic surgery, both in the United States and here in the middle. This is something once the AI world arrives, this will be very interesting. <laughs> you just instruct the AI to play it exactly, and then it kind of communicates and works in that manner. So, kidney cancer, adrenal cancer, and complex urologic reconstructive no, procedures such as pyeloplasties and ureteral reimplantation. Yeah. Robotic surgery. I think let's just continue with the presentation. We'll get back to this in a bit. All right. So basically the, the future direction that's envisioned on a larger scale is that uh, we're moving towards progress. Artificial intelligence is giving progress in different silos and different areas, but comprehensive progress will come once everyone starts moving in similar direction. The image that we obtain through the robot console. Third important aspect that benefits the, the surgeon is uh... Yeah, great, next slide please. <clears throat> Okay. 
Yeah, that's my human AI. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, so here, I'll just talk a little bit about the goals of the session. First, we want to really come to the same understanding of what is AI. So how many of you feel you know exactly what is AI? Right, exactly. There's one person. Do you have a definition for what is AI that you could tell us all? Yeah. Interesting. So that's one way of looking at it, one way of understanding it more from a technical lens. But essentially, it's the human brain. How we think, how we control technology, how we control the internet. That is what AI is. And when you want to understand AI deeply, just understand the difference between Google and ChatGPT. In Google, we would have to search, and there would be a lot of links given to us that we would try and find what's relevant to us, copy the text, paste it in a presentation, get the right images. So the thinking was done by us. It was just like a library or a repository that would give us information faster. Now ChatGPT, on the other hand, if I ask a question, is able to understand material and give me a personalized answer to what I want. So that is the, the stark difference between an AI and a non-AI, which is tech. So tech is able to give us information, run commands, but AI is able to understand the information, give us what's relevant. So it's actually a thinking task. It's a task of the brain. And that brain ability is what has been invented as AI, and that is what is taking us further. Computers were not able to understand things for the longest time. Whenever, How many of you have used Excel in the past? Yes. Uh, how many of you uh, ever thought that, you know, taking out the outliers or making a chart was, you know, it was a more uh, operation task? It wasn't a thinking task. And that was always done by you. It was always done by humans. No matter how many times they did it, the computer never told you, okay, let me do it for you this time. But now that era has arrived where you can tell the computer, I want the best chart for this data. And the computer is able to understand that data and guide you with the best chart taking out the outliers and giving you perspective analysis is not making the decision for you. It's making the decision easier for you. And that is exactly where that transition to the intelligence has come in of AI. So once you start realizing AI deeply, you'll realize it's just mimicking human skills. We call it computer vision, complex. But when you understand what computer vision is, it's the ability to see. I can see that you're sitting, I can see there are 12, 15 people here. I can see that you're typing on your laptop. That is the human skill of sight. And that is computer vision. Now you move towards interaction AI, how I'm interacting with you with facial expressions, being able to understand what you're seeing and giving responses. LLMs, deep fakes, they all fall in the realm of human skills created for the computer. Of course, there are more, there, there are plenty more. Chat GPT is one of them, generating videos, imagining videos, imagining images, making them. These skills are what are being created in the computer. And what we talk about general AI, which people are saying they're achieving, Samuel and Singh, is about having every human skill in one system, which is not close. And even Andrew Ng recently said it, it's not in the next couple of decades. It's going to be very far. So from an AI taking over perspective and taking over jobs perspective, that's one of the biggest fallacies that we can imagine. It's not taking over jobs, it's just changing the job. And it's changing them for the better. Because our roles are becoming less operational expensive operationally intensive. Why? How many of you enjoy just doing paperwork and sending emails and other things? I mean, that's the task that's not intellectually stimulating. It's more that you're just doing operational work because it's not being done automatically. In the future, that time gets freed up, where that is what AI does. So you have more time to make a vision, make a focus in a direction, and start pushing forward the organization and bringing new changes. So that is where human skill, the importance is coming in. Low-level skill, which is like manpower where you're picking up bricks, putting them at locations, those will start changing rapidly because that is not operationally efficient. AI is able to do it better, but the creative thinking, evaluating whether an AI is doing the right thing or not, assessing where the data used by AI is correct or not, and AI is not a one-time development. One time you have it, it doesn't mean it's going to last forever. It has to keep updating based on the world, based on the data, based on changes. So there are lots of roles coming in that are related to AI. So it's very important to understand that many fallacies exist. This is because people with limited to no knowledge of AI are talking that AI will do this, it'll take away the jobs, it will do this, but a deeper understanding is required to do this. But one thing for sure, it will change the jobs. 
and that will cause a temporary displacement. And any change there is a displacement, but it will kind of take you further. Uh, you had a question? Yeah, that was actually my question. Yeah, yeah. So we have a lot of work environment in Portland, we have to apply it all this same. Exactly. AI will displace a lot of jobs. Displace for sure. Autonomous vehicles, but Exactly. Uh, Uber and stuff like that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. How is that? Nice? So, um, where the, the change is coming in is uh, if you start imagining it from the, the basic time, from the time of when the cars were invented, there was a displacement when the cars came in. When the assembly line came in, there was a displacement again in the process. When the computers came in, people that were used to manual computation lost their jobs. Similarly, what's happening is there's a change. The self driving cars, yes, they might take away your role of operating the vehicle every time but the self-driving car usually will not be perfect. There will be areas where it cannot work and you'll need a practitioner to sit and ensure it's working correctly. But that's where roles would be less manual intensive, but you would still need to use your mind to ensure the system's working correctly for efficient security and manual control when needed. So Tesla is not allowed in many countries because we don't know whether the mistake is of the driver of the system. And uh, that sort of transition will happen when humans and AI start working together. So China started cities where self-driving cars work with humans, and that sort of transition is coming in. So people need to be reskilled. They need to be changing the way they're thinking, the way they're working. But what is happening is a better world for all. The common denominator, the base person is benefiting. They're getting a better living standard, faster delivery, better understanding of their personal health issues, which are being solved beforehand. So they're getting a better health standard of living, quality education they're going to be able to get much better education at a rural level, even where there are no instructors, no teachers, they'll be able to get hands-on expertise. Um, we cover that in a lot of the slides now. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So majorly the idea is first to show you what is AI, then show you how SDGs have been applied, and then also make you think about it, how you think we can apply it similarly in different areas. Because the only limitation in the era of AI is your creativity and your thinking. Almost everything that we can imagine is possible because the understanding has reached unbounded level. It's like imagine having millions of brains connected that can understand any data point, whether it's space, whether it's about human bodies, human genomics, everything can be understood. Our limitation was understanding that data. And now when it can be understood and we can communicate with that system to be able to get that same understanding to us, we're able to move much faster in a much better pace. And yes, the point you made where we just pass the data to the brain and then it understands how it understands is something we might not know, but what it understands we do know, and we're able to assess that. So with that understanding, plus our knowledge and creativity, we're able to move forward than any of us working individually. And that's where the human and AI collaboration is actually that future where we work together. Elon Musk has gone a bit further with the chip implant where he's directly connecting you to the internet, so you don't need to really type or use the computer anymore. Your brain directly communicates with the internet. But uh, I mean, that's a tad bit futuristic, but everything he's done is futuristic. But I think the base level integration, which is coming in is really on a big, very positive level. Um, okay, so what AI is, is the brain, like we discussed, next slide. So the only revolution that AI is compared to is not the tech revolution. AI is not even compared to tech, it's only compared to electricity. And the reason is the impact will be so far felt in any industry you can imagine, whether it's from farming, we need intelligent farming. We have water shortage issues. We have over pesticide usage in a lot of areas. And we have uh, wrong fertilizers being put, soil quality deteriorating year on year. Who is gonna make sure the right transformation is done at the micro scale at the exact location? That is where you need an AI. You need the brain for the drone. Uh, next slide. This is where it started from 1953. And the reason AI has so many definitions and so many ideas and so many people in it is because it started in 1953. We had a vision then that computers could be intelligent, but the definition of intelligence then was very limited. It was that we decide a function that will sit, and really that would be the intelligent function, which could be a regression model or, or any different sort of models. And the main innovation came in was the brain that could really decomplexify and move further from any of the human-generated models, because if we decided how the data is to be understood, then we are the limitation ourselves, right? It depends on our understanding of the data that this is how the data should fit. Um, so these are some areas where different AIs have been formed already. Um, one is definitely generative AI. How many of you have understood about generative AI? <laughs> Great. And how many of you are using it regularly? That's good. At least yeah. some people have started. So how has that changed the way you're working now with, with generative AI? Um, 
It's amazing. How, how does it change your process? How, how are you now thinking about it? Exactly. No, it's really amazing. It's truly amazing. And for the first time, the world has seen such a big transformation with computers can have intelligence. And that has changed the way of working. Emails that we have to respond to can be personalized. So imagine all your past emails are understood. And any new email that comes will get responded exactly the way you would have with just your confirmation. You send that email out. That saves you hours of thinking about what to respond, how to respond, what text to make, and really changes your space of responding to people. Um, imagine writing speeches, writing letters, writing presentations. They get made exactly precisely how you would make them without actually having to think that deeply about them. But don't get me wrong, it's not about not thinking at all. It's about evaluating it and understanding whether it's correct and putting it forward. So you're not doing the operational work, but you're doing the evaluation work, the critical thinking of whether it's right or wrong. And that is where the skill set of generative AI has brought. It's brought about a huge change. I mean, $100 trillion in five years is no joke. It's bigger than anyone could have imagined. And of course, Elon Musk did the first funding. So when Sam Altman started off with this vision of creating chat GPT, he asked Elon Musk for funding to set up an AI lab. And when he set up that lab, the first project was chat GPT. And that is how it all started. And of course, uh, Microsoft and other people came on board later and Elon Musk went out. But that was the vision. How do we have AI for all? That's how they got a lot of data sets and other things. Um, so that's one skill. Second is computer vision. Like I told you, the ability to see. There's the ability to interact, which is LLM and all these other technologies that are coming through, deep fakes. And of course, the data intelligence, which again, now data science is being promoted as AI. But data science is something that AI will do on its own. And that's where I think there's a mix that old AI was data science, but now AI knows how to do data science. So it's becoming a different transition. Uh, next slide. Sam, can we go to the next slide? Great, so this is just a quick understanding. So you all know where AI is, not getting into many more technical details, but just wanted us to be on the same page. So when we discuss applications, you understand where they're coming from. Um, basically, any AI, any technology built will have three aspects. There'll be the input. Where are we getting the data from? What is the data? Is it visual data? Is it text data? Or, or what is that data? The second will be the intelligence. What is the brain? What is the structure? What is processing it? And the third part will be the outcome. What are we getting out after it's processing? It's similar to what we learned in math, like a function that's a black box. So we pass in numbers, we get some numbers out. That is how any AI system will work. Creating the brain is actually the intelligence, that's the AI, that's the entire aspect, but the working is very similar. So we should really, when we plan an AI strategy, really understand the data, what we have around us, what we can use, where we can apply it to get that sort of larger acceptance and reach. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, you've done it, okay. And benefits, uh, I, I was going on my AI, the older space. Sorry, I wasn't sure it would be done so fast. So bringing, um, basically the idea is to understand this large amount of data. And that's where AI is useful, is ensuring compliance and correct actions are conducted. So the cameras replace our ability to ensure compliance. It's computer vision. So that's an area where it's been used extensively. And of course, guiding us to make the right decisions and right changes. That's where AI plays a crucial role to ensure the right decisions are being made because data is the best guide. Uh, next slide. All right, great. Now we come to more applications, and this is where I want it to be, so you can all not relate to it. The technical part is over. But uh, essentially, now SDG2, food for all. Um, India has recently made a statement that we will double our agriculture yield. Any of you here think it's possible without AI? There's no one on the house that thinks achieving doubled agricultural yield is possible without AI, and there are three reasons for that. And here is a deep dive on this entire SDG and sector. Uh, one is climate change. It's playing a very big role. We don't know when it's going to rain. We don't know the temperature, and it's changing dynamically over time, which means that our methods of the past, which were we're going to put the seed now, it's going to come out in nine months, the harvest, we're going to harvest it, put this much fertilizer, this much water, does not work anymore because the timeline has changed, the temperature has changed. In Germany, we're growing crops that would never grow hundreds of years ago because the temperature has changed. So in such a dynamic condition, we need a brain that can understand this change and guide us on what to do. And that guidance is crucial. 
And that guidance is where AI plays a very big role. And that's the only way to double your yield because it understands how much water to put, what fertilizer to put based on what soil type. And these are very big questions. And these are very important questions when moving forward. And these can only be answered with an AI because the precise understanding of your soil type, your micro weather, and different parameters that apply to your crop and condition can only be understood with intelligence like that. Yeah, please. Since you mentioned the farming, so uh, AI, maybe we can understand that uh, it's, uh, it's important for efficiency in farming and then I think Huawei is uh, one of the leading uh, companies in, in this uh, field. But, like, is it a need that the farmer says, okay, we, we need AI? Or, or is it like as a development by technology, so we got to AI? Because like, if we, if we look back maybe 100 years ago, that we, we, when we talk about farming, we think about like a traditional farmer, but like now, less than 100 percent of food production is uh, produced by my farmers, mostly mass production. So how does that sustainable, and how does that impact sustainability? Like, uh, wouldn't that be more sustainable like if we uh, use the, the traditional uh, farming uh, Methods. That's a very good question. So we've been doing work actually in farming a lot, so I'll be able to answer that in a deeper manner and also add some more ideas on how the quality of product and other things of farming are improved by using artificial intelligence. But specifically, what is happening is India, and I know the India story really well, is that farmer suicides are rising. Uh, they assume that the crop will grow correctly, but because of untimely rain, the entire produce is destroyed. And in a lot of cases, the quality of crop is going down. So they're getting B grade, C grade sort of revenue. And that's why the farmers are earning really little, like maybe $1,000 a year in terms of having their entire crop grow, which is not sustainable for them and their families and everyone. So farming is being subsidized majorly by the government in India because of this problem. But that said, the PM is saying we'll double the yield here without the detailed strategy. But uh, to achieve that, uh, the reason AI comes in is that guide. Because uh, we've been doing crop cycles. We've been doing it earlier, but we didn't understand why we were doing crop cycles, at least in India. Uh, now there's been bouts where everyone's growing sugarcane because there's a guaranteed buyout for sugarcane. Sugarcane is really bad for the soil. It lowers your soil quality. The next produce does not happen. If you grow it three or four times back to back, to your soil is bad for some time. You need to break. And that's where I think understanding of these deeper concepts is not uh, really the, the old way anymore. And if you bring in mass production, yes, in the West it started. The US is having 2.7 times the yield of India. But in developing countries, there is a bigger problem. And that's where that transition is now required. And of course, there are a lot of technologies coming in from Microsoft and other places based on US knowledge, which is if I give the NPK details to the farmer, they'll be able to make the right decisions. But in India, the farmers are usually an uneducated community. So when we A-B test the results with like the farm of the future versus their primitive practices, the farmers are not getting any benefit because they don't know what to do with this data, this value. So that intelligence, that guide is what they need. So uh, that's where the importance is quintessential. And a lot of countries that have primitive knowledge of how it was grown, that is not applicable anymore. Temperature, climate, and soil quality, all of this has changed. It was very different to do earlier. But if you try to repeat the same practices now, they won't work. And why they don't work, you'll not understand, because there's too many data, too many parameters. And that's where bringing in AI to understand that and guide is crucial. So that's uh, agriculture for you. Climate action, we want change at scale, monitor what pollutants are being released, at what locations, all that. Of course, satellite data, like Nikhil mentioned, you know, Sat is doing a lot of work in analyzing the satellite data, understanding satellite data, predicting how the emissions will be over time, and understanding a lot of different factors that play a key role in changing the climate is what artificial intelligence will bring to you. That understanding will be so deep that we'll be able to question it to answer our queries. That is this a good practice or not? Like lithium batteries that we're now moving towards in electric vehicles compared to car emissions. Uh, is that really good in the long run? So there are bigger questions that we have to kind of analyze and answer and move forward in that direction. Uh, third one, innovation industry and infra. Robotics already is taking over. Uh, we were just talking about how Japan has robotic restaurants and a lot of things coming in. Uh, the intelligence of the robot is AI. So if you see the transition from robotics 10 years ago to robotics now, and if you've seen the China Robotic Expo recently, you must have seen that the movements are getting more fluid. So Elon Musk has now started making suits that humans wear and walk. 
so that uh, he can get the data of what is the exact muscle movement when uh, humans are walking so we can replicate that in the robot because it's all about data and that's where you're getting that precisely human experience with a robot and that is what is coming with the new innovation in robotics imagine having a robot that doesn't fail or before it fails it tells you i'm going to fail predictive maintenance so these sort of transformations are coming in exactly with ai and innovation if we talk about if we start using tech and making apps uh, there are levels below ai AI yeah, is at a whole different level. It's personalized. It's able to understand you, give you exactly what you need. Uh, think about an operating system like we have Microsoft right now. We have to search for a file. We spend a lot of time. Where is the file? What is the file? Organize your desktop, other things. Imagine an AI organizing it for you, having it. It's a different level of ease, different level of operating, where we don't have to get into too many operational tasks and specifics. So innovation done with AI will take you much further, about a thousand X value compared to what tech is taking you. So this is a very big leap as well. Um, sustainable cities, uh, planning city routes, planned cities. AI can plan a chip for NVIDIA, can it not plan a city? I mean, these are actually very big questions, very big characteristics, problems that have plagued us. Because we have understanding of current, we have understanding of what we know, but the understanding of the entire data in the world and making judgments based on that, doing a PhD in a couple of months versus doing it in a couple of, in 30 years, as humans take that much time, uh, that is the difference between AI and how we're doing it in an old way. Uh, Ma'am, please. Um, I'm, I'm connecting what you just said to education. Doing a PhD in six months instead of seven months, instead of three years. Is that not plagiarism? It's not plagiarism. I'll, I'll explain you the entire context of where uh, this entire benefit is falling and how India is actually addressing this is by focusing on skills. Skills and experiential learning, which are two things where AI doesn't come in. But what AI is taking up the role of is information retrieval, as we call it in technology, that finding any information and giving us that information so we can use it. Earlier, there was library. We would sit, find the books, what's relevant to it. Then came Google. We would search online, find things, use it. Then has come ChatGPT, which is able to understand and give us the information. So that has been the transition to the AI phase. And that is what AI is taking up. It's the understanding of a lot of material that exists and guiding us on what we need. We are still thinking, we are still making the decisions, but that processing that information, remembering it, understanding it, and giving us the outcome is what AI is doing. So it's working as a very good assistant. And if that is plagiarism is if you're recopying a document, but if you're understanding the document and delivering some sort of outcome as your system, that is something that's helping people who are PhD or have the level of understanding faster. Because of what has happened with AI is some skills have become less important. And even with tech, the same thing happened. When the Google Maps came in, your navigation skills became less important that some people would remember routes for very far, but now it's less important. Similarly, once now ChatGPT has come in, your ability to just memorize things has become less important. But to evaluate the correctness has become more important that is it correct, is it not? Because we cannot be dependent on ChatGPT. ChatGPT is not our boss, it's our assistant where we're able to really ask it the right questions to get our work done and our output done faster. So we are still in control. So that is where a crucial role is played in to really take us faster. And the reason of AI coming in also is, is very important to understand it. It lowers your cost of doing tasks. You do it much faster and efficiency is the reason. And if you don't have efficiency in your system, there's another company that will be more efficient and take your place. And that's happened before. There are big companies like Kodak that used to run the show and cameras, and then a more efficient system came in. If you see Sony was more efficient, you take the photo, you get it out. You don't have to go and get it printed. And that efficiency came in and people switched. Kodak didn't believe in it because major revenues were coming just from the printed film. And that's where the transition happened. So this efficiency is what AI is bringing in everything you can imagine. So the transformation is evident. Of course, health and well-being, like I told you, creating a common medical intelligence. We have expert doctors for various fields. You have a question? Yes, thank you. Uh, one of the things that talk about a lot of things that we think, uh, I mean, things that are needed. For example, if I want to write the speeches, I can ask the uh, AI to write the specific topic. If I want to talk to point, then I think it makes us very dizzy. <laughs> so, what does that think about? Uh, I mean, and of course, it's about the connecting, and uh, it is just really uh, enough information about everything. The information we have is somewhere at some point. Maybe uh, it may not tell us uh, what's uh, that thing actually has a place. So if I, if I search something here, 
it may not be the same in the other place, like in Africa or something. So what else is that? Maybe can you give us a no, that's a very good question. Are you specifically asking it from a health perspective? I know. Just, Just generally India, yeah. the micro impact. Yeah. Makes sense. So uh, what happens is that uh, there is different data. There are micro factors that play a very big role, whether it's agriculture, whether it's healthcare, other things that genomes are very different. There are environmental aspects that they uh, understanding on it. And uh, AI's role there is to really understand the micro data. And it kind of fits the transformation or the AI brain that it brings you from a micro lens. It's not like uh, there's one technology that will be made in the US that will go everywhere because AI works differently on different data. And that's where data is really needed to fuel that intelligence. And that's where I think uh, micro areas, Africa, Southeast Asia, everything will play their own role because they have their own data, which is unique to their way of living, their genotypes, and everything really plays a crucial role, whether you take health, agriculture. There is technology today that exists that if you want a, a banana or you know a fruit to grow in a certain way, you want trees to have multiple fruits, all that can be done with AI with genetic engineering. And uh, these sort of technologies are really empowering the use of data effectively come to these outcomes. And we can use them without data if we do understand all these aspects ourselves. But AI is just making it easy for us to understand these aspects. So of course, uh, I mean, it changed our way when maps came in, then you become lazy to remember the route. So now you never remember it. Even when you want to go home every time, you might not know the way, you still put on the map to take me home. So it gives Google enormous power. If it changes your home, it'll take you somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's important to still think, but that is a human trait, right? Humans uh, don't want to do tasks that can be done by other systems. We want to focus on creativity thinking. And uh, that's where I think there will be behavioral changes, there will be changes in the way we work. And operationally heavy tasks slowly are becoming less relevant. If there are nanobots that maintain fitness for you, how many of you will go to the gym? <laughs> Any people raising your hands? One for fun. But if you're just all two, if, but if you're just always fit because nanobots are there doing the work for you, they're ensuring you get the right calories, right nutrition, everything, no matter what you eat, then we'll stop doing that activity because we want that outcome and that's what we're doing the activity. No, we yeah. magic. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where a bigger transformation is created with new technology intervention. But this phase, which you see now, is a phase that you'll not see in 10 years and in 15 years. It's actually the phase in a revolution. What happens in a revolution, which happened before as well, the tech revolution happened, a lot of dot-com companies came, things changed. AI now is a revolution phase where AI is going to change each and every aspect. This is the time when nations are built, wealth is created. There's a transformation. And uh, once you realize the depth of AI coming in, there's a new operating system that will prevail. There's a new search engine that will prevail. Google is having competition for OpenAI and ChatGPT, which was not expected 10, 15 years ago. Nobody thought you would compete with Google, but OpenAI is competing at all. So this revolution is going to create a big change in wealth dynamics globally. But you have to pursue the change. You have to start trying to make it. And what AI has really created in a very big global way as well is that the importance of data is crucial. So even if you have the best minds all sitting in the United States, uh, and they don't have access to the data of, you know, let's say Thailand, Africa, other places, they won't be able to build the solution for that region. So that's where multi-dynamics are playing a role in this AI future. We're building companies that really work in Africa or really work to that accuracy that we need. We need something that works almost every time, right? 95 to 99%. That dynamics is going to play a crucial role. So that's where it's very different from software where one company could build everything, everyone would use it. But in AI, the data plays a crucial role. So either they build the AI and then we personalize it and provide the solution there, or we can build it on our own if we learn how to build AI. So it's a very different type. Yes, sir. Great. Thank you. Maybe you will come to my point. Right? Definitely. But, uh, you know, uh, my question is about the uh, direction of AI's development is moving in the future. Does the uh, AI you know, may take the responsibility liability of the, uh, some uh, results caused by the AI's guidance or decisions because they are uh, autopiloting of the, of the car. Exactly. Yeah, it's, 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 it's uh, kind of stuck. Yeah. Because you know, when they build accident, people are taking this exactly. exactly. uh, completion is not there. What is your, what's your thing? This is a very, very good question. And uh, we actually give this example on a medical context. So when the AI makes a mistake in diagnosis, it gives a, a false cancer diagnosis or something, it's not the AI's fault, it's the doctor's fault. Mm. 
because the doctor is the only one that can certify it. What AI is doing is helping the doctor. And that's again where the self-driving car job issue comes in, right? We need a person to verify that the AI is making the right decisions, even though he might not make every decision at the same time. So having drivers just sit instead of drive and really ensure that if AI is doing something wrong, they fix it. Uh, that is where human roles are happening. And that's exactly how China is doing it in taxis, where they have these taxis that drive on their own, but the driver's sitting to ensure it's working correctly. That transition is where we are. And that transformation gives benefits to everyone because the, drive, the driving is happening in a systemic manner. It's not uh, too much variance, not someone driving fast, someone driving unsafe. That average driving capability has gone up because AI is doing the driving, but the edge cases still have problems. That's where the human intervention comes in. And that's where the bigger picture, once you understand the growth and progress, is when humans and AI work together. Alone, AI cannot take us forward. It's when both work together to ensure a better system, a better progress for all. And that is critical. And if you see any AI technology that's reached that scale, it's when both are working together well. So even ChatGPT, I mean, no, no one will just use ChatGPT. They have to process it, understand it, and give the outcomes. That's why the prompt engineer role has grown, right? Which is how humans are interacting with the AI and delivering the results. So that's where the human in the middle or that, that role is going to be very important. And prompt engineer created so many jobs all of a sudden. Of course, it's not going to be a long-term job but it's going to be a job that's going to change in its way of working as the models upgrade, as their way of working upgrades, the person at the prompt engineering role needs to upgrade their skill and understanding. So that, I hope that answers your question. Yes, so that means the, uh, they've never drink before. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, that will happen too. Um, of course, in peace, justice, strong institutions, uh, AI is being used to speed up resolution of cases, understanding different aspects. Now, chat GPT can understand your email, give you a summary, can understand a case, give you the expected outcome. So what the judge has to do is decide whether it's right or wrong. And if it's right, he has to give a le lesser an explanation. If it's wrong, then he has to give more explanation. So it becomes easier to have a, a bigger constant justice system across especially developing countries and other areas where the system is not that strong. Um, in terms of law enforcement, being able to access the data, China already has buses. When it sees you, it knows your criminal history. And they're already tracking uh, the way uh, people are behaving. There's a social score. That if you're jaywalking, they'll penalize you, reduce your score. If you're doing wrong things, your score goes down and your cost of accessing government services goes up. So, I mean, in the West, everyone complies with laws, but normally India also has this problem. So does uh, China, where people will not just comply. If you've made the law, the compliance becomes an issue. And here with this score, it's like having a penalty on your insurance every time you make a, a problem, right? So that similar concept has come in there and it's working very effectively in China. So China is moving fast. It's like very close, not sharing much media, just working fast on research deployment. And I will be showing you a case study in the education side as well, where China have really started having um, these headsets, which track your BCI, your, your brain computer interface, your concentration levels. So if you're not concentrating, the teacher gets to know, and it's able to understand whether you're understanding or not. So it's kind of ensuring the student has that level of knowledge directly. And with computer vision, they're monitoring their expressions, whether they're distracted or not. And they're getting personalized recommendations and study material changing based on how they are learning. So they've already moved forward. They don't uh, think much, they act fast. So that movement is happening where the, the global AI transformation, the scale is tipping towards China in a way. Um, you had a question? So it's a bit related to the previous question. Yes. I do understand the importance of human verification of any AI process or AI decision. Yeah. But how do we, I'm a bit concerned about the confirmation bias that humans have. Like, of course, if you have the judge taking the decision that the machine is already suggesting, the probability of that judge is going to say, no, like, let me review this in detail, maybe the machine is not right. Like, especially when the judge will probably be expected to uh, take decision on 100 cases instead of 20. Exactly. It, it was doing, it's a bit tricky for me to really believe that human verification will really allow to detect errors in the machine. Um, so that's a very brilliant question. And in this aspect, what we really need to consider is what is now and what is the future. As long as there's progress with AI and technology coming, it might not be reaching the optimal level where we want it, but it is a better level from today. So that today the process is there's a panel that sits, there's a judge and the decision's made and then it kind of goes forward. If machine does the pre-processing, where it understands the details, verifies if the evidence is correct or not, if their image is shared, it understands from the images whether the evidence stated is correct or not, and if there are any problems that are highlighted. Uh, that helps people make better decisions. 
specifically in medicine, what happens is most doctors know how to detect uh, different cancer tumors and other things in the x-rays. But how AI speeds it up is it highlights a lot of them that could be or that are likely to be. So it helps doctors relate to it faster and understand that AI has found these okay. And these are likely, and sometimes what doctors will miss, AI will find. So it kind of it's their collaboration that helps people reach a better outcome. But I'm sure it's not the best. It can always be better, and that's why there's innovation that will continually exist. But it is better than what is today. And that is the reason AI is coming forward for progress, to build people forward. I hope that answers your question. If I can just add to the, yeah, yeah, your comment as well. I'm Mario, by the way. Uh, actually, that happened in the US where the systems that the judges were using was causing uh, significant biases against minorities from, you know, uh, African American heritage community and all that. So, and what they found out was is because the data was biased. And one helpful. way to address that, that I think is lacking right now in the global community, even in the private sector where I come from, is AI governance. So there's such a thing where as an AI is being built, it's a black box. We don't know what it is. We don't know what are the weird biases it has. There has to be some sort of a governance within the institutions and organizations to review constantly this data to make sure that these kinds of biases are out. And this is what is going down to the lines of ethics in AI. And I think that's something that needs to catch up. The, you know, the yes, of certainly. And uh, that is one area where if we are calling it as a certification of the AI or whether it's built apt to be distributed is something which some countries are now starting to take upon themselves, where they kind of ensure that the AI is evaluated by an unbiased tool rather than just promoting any AI that could have harm during the change, it kind of is assured at a government level or agency level that it's correct. And that sort of transformation needs to come for sure, because any and every AI, whether it's on financial guidance sites where they're guiding you on what shares to buy or not, but if your portfolio drops, it's your responsibility. But to most people, they commit, which is something we'll be talking about in the financial panel as well. Uh, they commit that, yes, you'll get 20% return. And some places, uh, if you see on Instagram, Facebook, they're marketing using Elon Musk's name. They're like, Elon Musk has said, if you use this, just be gaining this much yeah. value on shares every year on year. Um, so that is incorrect, and that needs to be regulated. And customers need to know what it is. So that's where regulation plays a key role. And where regulation should come from is where governance knowledge needs to be developed, where government officials, elected officials need to really understand what is this? How is it working? And how do we really ensure the better progress for all? Because the responsibility of good development of AI at the government level. And corporates definitely have their own incentives, own goals, which are not always aligned with the country's progress or with equity for all. And that's where I think global organizations will play a key level in really ensuring the right development, the right progress. And that's why it's important for us today and other people that are getting involved in this. Yes, it's slightly technical, but taking it down to a level where we understand what it does. So at least we can ask the right questions is very crucial. Now, there was recently one video I saw, I'm not sure whether it's a deep fake or not, but understanding of AI even in government officials is at a different level. Even when we talk about understanding of cloud, um, they don't really understand that cloud is still data that's lying on the server. It's not that data is already distributed. So these sort of understandings need to be given because they are the ones who are making the decision for everyone. The corporates are making the decision for themselves, but these decisions need to be right for the people. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Hassan. I hope that answers your question. Oh, the data, yeah. yeah, sure, sure. Perfect. Um, so education, like I told you, in, in China, there's been a huge transformation in education. They're optimizing for perfection. They want everyone to learn to a certain level. They want everyone to progress at a certain level. And that's what's leading AI to move forward for them. And of course, personalized AI assistants to understand the data for you and guide you on how to learn it in the best way. Imagine if you're not good at math, your math course takes 20 hours. And if you're good at math, you finish it in four hours, but you both have a similar level of knowledge because the AI ensures to get asked more questions and you're taught what concepts you don't know in more detail. That is already implemented. And that is where the gaps in global learnings kind of will play a key role in ensuring good education for all. And uh, of course, uh, bigger interventions of having humanoids teach where you don't have access to teachers or empowering teachers with AI to get the right information, right lessons, is something that can be done to ensure quality education for all, because all means all. Whether it's rural, whether there are 100 people in the school, whether there are 20 people in the school, they all should have equitable education. And that is not humanly possible to have the best teachers everywhere. So developing a collective intelligence 
that ensures that works based on student capability. Because if we teach the same way to all, there's not the same learning outcome for all. And they're usually regional biases, learning biases, capability biases. But if we cater to them from a knowledge level, where the instructor knows that AI is guiding, that this is their learning level, this is how you should teach them, understanding even their skill sets, which a profession would be of interest, and guiding them in overall level for development is where AI plays a key role. So if any of you are working in this space, this is actually one of the very big innovations that will come in a large way. And it started at some sort of corporate level, some startups in edtech are trying to do it. But at a global systemic level, making it happen with some quality standards being set and some goals being set to something that's needed in this space. Because uh, education is not where multiple people can just come in and promote any education whatsoever. There need to be certain standards, certain principles. And that's where this development will uh, play a key role in ensuring rural compete. So I had recently gone in India. We work in Baramati. I'll show you that video also. But um, there's uh, one place near there with the royal family of uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji. It's one of the Maharashtra royal families, 1500s till then. Their descendants were there. So they told me a statement which will resonate with all of you. He said, with uh, all this technological advancement, we are 100 years behind cities. They agree, they know that. They've seen that in a rural scale. And other cities in India, and we start looking at Silicon Valley, it's probably 1,000 already. But with AI, we'll be 1,000 years behind. So they're realizing this. They're realizing that the growth is not happening for everyone. And that's where bringing that growth for everyone is crucial. And that's where involvement, inclusion, and of course, from financial, from all different aspects, is very important to move everyone forward. Uh, next slide, please. It's a little lag. Zero hunger. Farmers are becoming intelligent. And uh, they're now starting to really understand that they need the support. So India has this uh, KVK methodology uh, where they set up, it's called Krishi Vigyan Kendra, but basically artificial uh, intelligence. But uh, earlier it was just agricultural intelligence uh, for farmers to be able to give them the knowledge of how to grow and solve problems at the rural level. So they're farmers that interact with these center of excellences to bring about the right decisions, new research in seed, new research in preventing pest attacks. If there's a pest attack, they can reach out to the center and get immediate support. So these sort of initiatives have been done from the 80s, 90s, but now they're picking up steam with AI. Um, so here, the idea is that how do we ensure yield for a farmer? Farmer's entire mission is that I spend this money, I want this output. And if any technology is getting placed in this entire piece, and if the farmer is paying for it, they need to guarantee the yield. And that is what the entire farmer's black box is. He doesn't want to be told the NPK values. They don't want to know any other details about the crop. They want the guaranteed yield. And for that, AI will play a crucial role because they'll be able to understand micro elements. Test attacks can be predicted. How many of you agree with that? Attacks. To a certain level. To a certain level, exactly. And there are conditions that the plant undergoes, the soil undergoes, the crop undergoes that can be a precursor for a pest attack. And if we change at that point, then no crop is lost. So these are certain conditions managing the soil condition through the entire growing process, ensuring if there's gonna be a rain with an accurate prediction level of AI and ensuring the harvest is done before that, cutting losses, but ensuring certain progress in the harvest is had so farmers' minimal income is achieved. That is what is the future of agriculture. And farmers in India, especially minority farmers, are from really low intellectual levels, not very educated, don't have knowledge of technology. Bringing it to them is another problem, getting them aware, getting them comfortable to use it. So solutions have to be micro. They have to be specific to the region. Giving them a complex dashboard is not going to help them. They need decisions. They need ways of moving forward. And they need guarantees and yield because they are poor. And a lot of them are committing suicide because they cannot pay back the loan because the output has not come. They get a promise of harvest, they grow something, but because of rain, it doesn't work. And then they can't pay back the loan, so they commit suicide. So that is the bigger issue in India, farmer suicide that's happening. The agriculture is 16% of India's GDP. And with that entire progress, how farmers are being treated in a way and not being able to achieve that outcome, because uh, they don't get paid as much. We have a very big uh, middle system in agriculture where there are the bulk traders that buy the agriculture from the farmers, then they trade it to the city. The farmers get very minimal income on it. So ensuring their growth financially is a very big problem that India is dealing with. And that's one of our next five-year agenda of ensuring that their income goes up and yields go up for the land. So that's where AI is going to play a very big, crucial role. I think the presentation is oh, no. We're on break? Okay, we're on break. I, I hope this was interesting so far.
<laughs> Any feedback to optimize this further uh, in the next? Because I come from a highly technical background, trying to bring it down. You've bit. done so well. Thank you. I'm an art person, and I've understood you very well. <laughs> <laughs> We've been communicating with a lot of government officers in India, so we meet the planning commission. A lot of people that come from zero background in AI, not even any tech different. background, <laughs> and they kind of also need to understand this. So this yeah. is not something that tech companies will guide. It has to be a common decision. Mm -hmm. That's communicating them is also good. So what we're planning in October 24th, 25th is really to guide this decision making. Just making an AI task force is not taking countries forward. You cannot just copy paste models that work in the US and just say it will work. It has to be very unique to your understanding and who is on that task force, who is guiding it for you is very crucial. And like I told you, AI is, is there from 1953. And how many of you have uh, like studied economics or like technical disciplines like that? There's this concept called linear regression. That is also AI. And then there's also AI brain that's AI. So with this gap of something so minimal and something so maximal in AI, everything passes the AI. But real AI is what can scale. Real AI is where people can understand and grow further. So that is where the understanding is critical. The regulation is critical as well, like you mentioned, but regulation after understanding, not with blind understanding that Terminator's coming, so we restrict mm -hmm. AI. <laughs> <laughs> and the bigger problem is, is it really coming? You, you should understand that to be able to make your decisions. Most people that are on these panels don't have that understanding. They're more media knowledge driven not technical knowledge for them, so it's crucial to have that role. So we break for, I guess, lunch, and then we'll connect back. All right, let's start. Healthcare will undergo dramatic... Now, this is a small video on uh, the healthcare and what I was telling you about personalized medicine and all that coming through. This will shed some light on it so you understand how healthcare is changing. Uh, let's start with this, please. In the decades ahead, healthcare will undergo dramatic transformations. Medicine will become more precise, value will shape care delivery, patients will become empowered consumers. And digitalization will transform every facet of healthcare. Patients will have a digital twin, a customized computational model of themselves, enabling Dr. Clive to anticipate ill. Um, they get called? Just take a look. Yeah, yeah, sure. Of course, we'll share that with you. Can we continue the video? See, these are the problems with technology. And that's why we need to enter to the AI era because it handles these problems internally. And we don't have to worry about them. But essentially, this video is really showing you how the future of medical analysis is happening because they can predict how diseases grow within you, understand that before, and give you the cure right then. Even if there's a new disease that did not exist, it's forming. We can understand how that is relating to our genotype, our blood type, our complication in the environment, and how we can really create that change at an early stage so that that doesn't reach the level of onset, so we don't get sick, in other words. <laughs> Sorry, playing it again? Okay. Yes. Yes, yes, uh, I'll speak louder. Thank you. Thank you. When you think we don't get sick, this. Yes. Uh, maybe it's again it's nature because nature creates things on both sides. <laughs> this nature created for the positive, or or you know how are these forces governed? That that's also a very big philosophical question. Whether it is that it wants us to get sick, or it is because of our lifestyle that we've adopted by commercialization and growth that is the reason we're getting sick. You know there are many cases like cancerous growth has a link to processed food and. You know, other things. So, I mean, is it us that's causing us to get sick? And are there ways to avoid it? It's very philosophical. But if AI can prevent it, no matter what we do, we don't get sick. Then I think that's better for all. All right. Should we get to the slide that video doesn't play? Or... OK. Yeah, yeah, please, please. Go ahead. Go ahead. So we've got only 50 minutes. I think then it's lunch break. So I'll try to cover this. Medicine well. will become more precise. Value will shape care delivery. Patients will become empowered consumers. 
and digitalization will transform every facet of healthcare. Patients will have a digital twin, a customized computational model of themselves, enabling Dr. Clive to anticipate illness, guide therapy options, and predict outcomes of procedures. Expanding precision medicine will enable radiologists to make highly specific diagnoses for Stephen without unwarranted variations. AI-powered decision models fed by vast population health data will improve diagnostic accuracy. Healthcare will become anticipatory organized around Paula's medical conditions and available around the clock, transforming care delivery. Multidisciplinary, highly productive care teams structured around patients and their needs will collaboratively deliver the full cycle of care. All interactions with John will become convenient, personalized and compassionate, improving patient experience. Supported by real-time monitoring and guidance, John will become more empowered and have physical and virtual access to care when... Great, so this kind of sheds light on what I was mentioning so you could see it visually, that how your data is starting to predict how diseases for you will manifest. And over time, we understand human genome very specifically for different types of people from different backgrounds, different spaces, and understand how diseases will prevail right from you getting in the car and uh, AI noticing that you have a likelihood of getting a heart attack in the next 30 minutes. And instead of the self-driving car taking you to your destination, it takes you to the nearest hospital. That is a future that is coming. And it's almost there because individual technologies exist, but integration and deployment is now happening. So this is on the healthcare side. Of the next one, should we play that too, if it's playing well? And this next video, I wanted to show you that with AI coming in or robotics coming in, there are new goals coming from jobs. At Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, robotics is bringing the latest inventions in surgery to our patients. Robotics allows us to do things that was never before possible in surgery. It's an extension of our own eyes, allowing us to see in three dimensions. It's an extension of our own hands, allowing us to perform sophisticated surgeries through incisions the size See the process of the changing of the medical fraternity, so they need to adapt. Cleveland Clinic has a long history of advanced minimally invasive and robotic surgery, both in the United States and here in the Middle East. We've been doing these procedures for over 20 years. Complex, minimally invasive robotic surgeries in the field of urology are extremely common and allow us to treat patients with a broad spectrum of diseases, including prostate cancer, kidney cancer, adrenal cancer, and complex urologic reconstructive procedures, such as pyeloplasties and ureteral reimplantation. Robotic surgery benefits the surgeon in different aspects. First of them is avoiding surgical trauma when we do some sort of operations, there is some trauma that disappears when you operate a patient under a robotic platform. Second advantage is the magnification of the operative field. So this uh, was to show you that as technology comes in, new job roles are formed, new responsibilities are given, assessing whether the patient is right for a robotic surgery, all that. So it is not that AI takes away jobs, it's that it creates them, it changes them. And if you see the doctor operating the robot, it's something you wouldn't have heard of 10 years ago, but now they are getting qualified and able to do that. So that is the skill shift. And there are small statements being given in media as well, that in the future, if doctors don't know how to operate AI, they will not have their roles anymore. They won't have their jobs anymore. Similarly, AI manager is one of the biggest rising professions. But if you need to manage a company that has AI or is building AI, you need to be able to understand it. So that's where the adaptation and inclusion is going at very large levels. And that was the entire reason I showed you the video, was basically that visually this exact transformation is happening that we're seeing. It's not that it's a future or, you know, it's uh, going to come in the long run. It's already here. If Google says by 2030, nanobots will make us immortal and imagine where the other technologies are. That is what we need to realize that the time is now to adapt in AI, make the right decisions, make the right transitions and guide your country, your organization forward 
to benefit because uh, the growth, the exponential growth that you've seen in many companies, countries, everywhere happens in time of change. Time of change gives you great opportunities. When there's time of stability, then it's very difficult. If I ask you to make a better operating system than Microsoft right now, it'd be very difficult, almost impossible to compete at that scale. But when the transition is changing, when the playing field is changing, there's a new version of an operating system to come, then you might as well be able to do it. And that's what led to the rise of OpenAI, which came in the new field of AI and tried to create an AI-first solution that's now competing with Google, with search GPT. Google value dropped 100 billion once chat GPT got a, a large recognition globally. And that is the transition that's upon us. Yes, Max. Uh, so I know you talked about, you just mentioned again, the big change in the wealth dynamics. Yeah. But given how expensive what the compute power you need to have to do these things, do you still think we'll end up with monopolies? Or I don't know, I'm not, I don't know if I call it monopoly, but yeah. obviously Microsoft now has chat GPT, Google, has their own, and will Elon we Musk still see the concentration? So, so why why do you think the dynamic the money dynamics will change? Since it's a very good question, I, and um, I don't see where that why that happens. Happen. So, we're talking about the current AI. There's right. current AI that needs significant amount of compute to process. Right. But there is AI coming that is research because this is a problem that many companies are facing. That why do we need to put in so much compute to get the AI model trained? Right. That there are new models that are being devised as we speak that reduce the outlay of energy, that reduce the outlay of compute requirements, that will then power the future. And we're not talking about systemic model creation as well. We're not saying we'll make chat GPT or compute heavy models. We'll yeah. make application heavy models. So when we have data and we have some sort of structures, there's this concept in AI, which again is technical called transfer learning, where we can transfer intelligence from existing models to our data sets. So smaller application-driven companies can still reach billions of dollars and that value can still grow. So they might not make the next chat GPT, but then they could make the next application level company that arise in many spaces. And that's definitely even at doing, a lot of people have said that the application is an area which can grow very fast without heavy compute requirements. But that's where the change happens because data has equal value to compute to AI in this revolution. And that data lies in a lot of countries, a lot of places, and specialized right. knowledge lies in a lot of these places. Like I think someone was mentioning about agriculture, that uh, specialized knowledge in rural areas of the farming practices that work. Once that is built into AI algorithms and that knowledge grows around and gets taken around, that is what benefits and creates more growth for all. So but that's my, where the opportunity arises. My understanding is a lot of these large companies, for instance, are going to Africa and trying to buy the data sets. So, exactly. so, so therefore, I don't really see that. We, how do how do we make sure that the money dynamics work in a way that actually allows other individuals to this is a very good question economically? I, I mean, I don't. This has been our our work actually of late. Uh, we've actually been working with Indian government and other places to build that same transformation. We've reduced the complexity of building AI and applied AI, yeah. and taking that to a lot of schools, colleges, universities across yeah. India. Jamaica, we've started as well, where we're bringing that knowledge to them instead of taking their data and building it in the US and selling the product back to them. Right. Uh, we're actually giving them the knowledge. So we're like, if you want to sell the data, you can. Right. Or if you want to build your own, you can as well. So giving them the opportunity to prosper, letting the government decide, but at least ensuring they have an opportunity to build their own AI is something we're trying to push on from a social impact level I and see. give the countries a chance. Because I understand. I mean, it, it struck no, me as uh, it's a good way to think about it. That uh, you know, even when Stanford started, uh, there was Harvard, there were big universities, but then they started, they went on their paths, and now last thirty years, major innovations in tech have only come from one university. So that is where I think it takes the people, the knowledge, and uh, the real idea to create a breakthrough that creates this transformation. So there is no transformation too big in the revolution of AI. Compute might be a temporary hurdle. Indian government is setting up government level compute centers mm -hmm. with, with large budgets. Other countries are trying to do similar things. Uh, but I think compute will not be the bottleneck. The bottleneck key. will be? Bottleneck will be knowledge. Knowledge and data, which will be the two directions. Because no matter how much compute you have, that yeah. expertise of being able to build it will be crucial. And so that's- I don't, want to, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but at some point, are you, are you going to talk about, like, I, I, what does it mean to help someone be digitally literate 
in yeah. this kind of world? What do they need to know? Like you said, the prompt engineering will go away. All these exactly. Things. So, so what is it that we actually need to be imparting to people so that they will be able to embrace whatever these Perfect. new technologies will be? You, you can save it for later. I don't want to. No, product. certainly. And that's uh, one of the the bigger questions of how governments, people, everyone need to adapt and understand yeah. the working of these systems. Because what is going to change is the way of working. But mm -hmm. the system that's underlying it, the AI brain technology, is only changing slightly and becoming slightly different. But the working is still on the same phase. So understanding of AI, how it works, what it does, not from a coding level or from a building level, mm -hmm. but how it processes knowledge, how it works, what are biases that can arise, what are problems that can arise, when does it fail, these sort of knowledge pieces will be unparalleled in the long run in any company or in any educational level, or even when you're operating AI, if you know it's inner working, you can get better results out of it. And that becomes a competitive edge. So what I think the overall knowledge of the AI landscape will be very crucial in your company. And companies are looking for these champions. Like we're working with the hospital where we're creating a department of AI and medicine. So that'll be the first department of AI and medicine in India as a country where AI is the focus in a hospital. They said, we have the data. Why don't we champion medical initiatives? Because no engineer knows medical better than us. And that's where the entire focus has switched and AI has become accessible, which is what is uh, the idea of that knowledge of how AI works, how we can integrate it, how we bring the right data to create the right transformation is what I think is crucial for organization. And they're still trying to adapt, but talent gaps are kind of restricting them from adapting. And that's exactly what I saw in Jamaica when we trained the YPO leaders, all the, the big business owners and government. Um, they don't have people to do the AI, they were focusing on setting up call centers. As a country that will just set up call centers for the United States, we're close to them, and we speak English, we can do it. And that's what happened was after they met me, I told them that AI can do that better. And AI can actually do it more personalized. It'll remember every last interaction with you and tell you exactly the answer of what you want, understand your accent, understanding your way of communicating and personalize it. And not just for one person, but for everyone that calls. It'll be active 24 seven and it'll be cheaper how will the people compete? And that's when the, the prime minister decided that it's better we build AI and become an AI first country. So he's starting with our, our same model of setting up the labs, which can help their people at skill, at school, at college, start learning AI to apply it in their fields, not to build the next research papers, but to apply it, which is a skill that almost everyone can gain. And that has been a, a bigger win for them as a country where they're trying to move in that direction and really empower everyone to move in the right direction. Because one big question I, I normally ask is, if AI can write code, how many of you believe AI can write code? Great. Who doesn't believe AI can write code? Great. Perfect. So almost everyone knows that. So then how many of you think that uh, AI can do blockchain? Well, there's one, two, three. Okay. Great. So there are five, six people that are thinking in that direction. So when governments in India now, what's happening is like, Bodies like NASCOM, which is our association of technology and companies, are saying, let's teach school kids blockchain. So those incentives are different. When you know AI can do blockchain and AI can do coding, then shouldn't we train them for something that AI would not do so that they are relevant in the future? And that is what thinking needs to reach everyone. You need to understand what AI is, what it can do, what it cannot do, and how do we really plan this future world out at a governance level? So what, that, are you, what are you teaching them? We're teaching them artificial intelligence, how to apply it, how it works how in different fields, building that knowledge. So okay. I, I, I don't have that video on this system, but I will show you how our school children at Mayo College in Ajmer are starting to build AI, and that's been recognized at the India level, and went to Jamaica, and now we're taking it to multiple yeah. countries through India. Just want to follow up on this one, hmm. question from two. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned several times Jamaica. So uh, I think I understand what you're saying that there are like certain countries or, or nations that are they don't have uh, maybe as much resources that uh, compared to others. But like a uh, uh, knowledge is is uh, cheaper to invest in uh, to, to like other countries like uh, Taiwan, Singapore maybe exactly so to to uh, to boom uh, economy. But are there other examples than Jamaica? Second question, maybe you're getting you into this to, to the legal uh, yeah. uh, part. But like uh, my question always is. Uh, does that need a, um, a change in the legal system or to laws of privacy or data sharing? Uh, does that need a, a prior to, to, to this, uh, 
investment in AI. Yeah, no, definitely. We'll get to those questions and uh, specifically the data privacy. A lot of countries are doing their own regulation. There's GDPR, there's India's regulation, PDPA, Personal Data Protection Act. There are a lot of different regulations happening. And that is exactly what we want to cover on 24th, 25th October with Michael, where we really guide a lot of these decisions forward, where how do you make an AI task force? Who should be in it? What should be the outcome? How do you analyze research outcome? And this is a must for a lot of developing countries that are moving in these directions. What should be part of your Data Protection Act? And what is data? How should it be restricted for corporates? How should it be available to startups? Now, India is starting to create a database which they'll provide to startups from a government level to let them do AI innovation. So then the data problem also goes away. So these are some strategies that different countries are adopting differently. But having a global mission, every country can start moving in similar directions, learn from each other's mistakes and move forward will be better progress for all. And that's our entire agenda where we want to ensure that this knowledge reaches every decision maker so that they can start creating the right transformation, standing still, is not a solution. If you just regulate AI, say we don't want AI, we want to go back, that doesn't mean everyone's going to go back. And uh, there are many forces that are working faster. So it will only be that those companies will build the AI then come to you to sell it. Because uh, companies that don't adopt AI, if I'm giving you a lower cost product, it's a higher quality product, it's better, more easier to use, and you like it better, how many of you will not switch to this sort of a product? No matter how big the brand is that you're currently using. I mean, most of you will switch to it. And that is where that competition came in, right? Sony brought in the camera, Kodak went, Apple bought the iPhone, BlackBerry went. But that's what kind of starts happening when you make something better for the people. And AI is what is championing that because the level of understanding personalization can do, nothing else can do. So that is crucial to really understand and use it in your favor. So you also jump with the revolution. In dot-com, there were so many technologies that came and rose very fast. That was the revolution where understanding of dot-com was not there everywhere. Now everyone understands what a dot-com is, what a tech is. AI is that similar revolution, but 100 times the scale. The compute could only store data and you know do things that you wanted to do with the user interface. But now, this can understand the data and tell you what to do, and it can understand any amount of data and guide you in the right direction. So this is a bigger revolution than anything we've imagined. Energy efficiency is gonna go up in a big amount with AI. There are already solutions for that. So if you're talking about smaller problems that can arise because of AI, there are many bigger solutions that can arise with AI, of course, preventing terrorism, predicting terrorism, predicting crime. A lot of these things are already being done as we speak. These are not new innovations that will happen. They've been done in secretive silos. But the idea is really to ensure everyone progresses in the same direction. Uh, next slide, please. So, Hassan will try to go a little fast now. So <laughs> we can have more questions. But yes, zero hunger we covered. Health and well being, remote treatments. Imagine having the best doctor sitting right at Geneva and treating a patient in rural India. That is the power of remote treatments. That's what AI brings. If you can see how the robot was being controlled by the person, uh, we can actually have an AI control the robot and the person just monitor. So that is where scale of good treatment, good doctors will start happening across the world. And of course, AI-based doctors that assist as well will be available, which can be question answering systems. That let's say I don't know what this disease is as a doctor in rural, I can ask that AI, what would be this disease? These are the parameters, this is the blood rate, what are the likelihood of different diseases? And I get that assistance real time. That means I don't need to memorize all the books I just have to have that understanding. And as new diseases are detected, invented, we are able to really understand what are the precursors, how are they caused, and AI is able to assist us in capturing and applying that knowledge from day one. So we don't need to be experts in diabetes to understand that the person has diabetes, which we now do with the device. But similarly, for other diseases, for cancer, for uh, heart disease, for different diseases, with AI, we become at a certain level of expertise that we can detect it prevent it for our community and guide them on the right treatment. Of course, expertise will be needed eventually, but at least the preliminary early detection this cancer can be stopped if detected early. That's a very big problem in India. The detection happens at stage four. And if you detect it at stage four in rural, there's not much doctors can do. And then there are bigger problems. Bringing in AI creates a much bigger benefit to this entire system of healthcare. Um, of course, medical training, predictive diagnostics, medical skill, uh, doctors are not there everywhere. 
they're there in big cities, but in rural, no doctors. In a lot of countries, no medical professionals. And even if they're there, they're not of that skill. They would give you common medication or not for all diseases. Giving that training is also another problem. In different countries, even the trainers of that level are not available to ensure doctors of that skill develop. And medical skill is developed by practice, by doing. So if you're able to simulate the doing through the metaverse and have online AI assistance, how you must have seen the deep fakes with Obama and other technologies, those deep fakes that are able to personalize different guidance to you based on your knowledge and make you do procedures which are monitored with computer vision. So now I, I hope you have that basic understanding of these terms because I wanted that initial technical understanding so you understand what I mean by these technologies. So these are applications that we can create. And that is the future of learning in rural and every yes, ma'am. Yeah, when you were talking about all this technology, this is amazing. And I see that revolution is going fast, fast, fast. And we think it's sustainable development. All the problems exist. Is there any solution that is being put for AD to resolve all this problem? And when you have all these fantastic technologies, for example, in preventive health. Yeah. What is your reaction of the producer of drugs, for example? What are they going to do? Because preventive health is exactly. very difficult to discuss. Exactly. If the interest are huge. Exactly. And when you see in all these communities and countries that don't have exactly. money to support all these technologies, exactly. what is the way to, to arrive to them? Because we know that in, even in big countries, there are people that don't have access Exactly. Because it's very expensive. Exactly. And this probably would be. So it's fantastic, but how to apply, how to make this more inclusive? That's that's a good approach. And this, uh, exactly, I think a lot of our discussions on this implementation part stem back to exactly the problem we've been solving, because the, the reason I moved from US to India to contribute was really to address this exact issue that if everything's just developed by a few companies and few people, then how will we make it accessible and how will we ensure that everyone has access and rights to it? So what solution we found was we bring AI to the people, but then the cost of knowledge reduces. And the second benefit comes in that data is local. Data is not something you have to pay for. If you have it around you, governments can afford it. Uh, ISRO built the spaceship that went to the moon at one-tenth the cost of NASA or lower. The main reduction was manpower cost and of course, material costs would be slightly lower because of other aspects, but they built it. The knowledge was there. They were supported by different global agencies, but they built it with knowledge. That speaks of the power of knowledge. If the knowledge reaches them, they can build such solutions and start moving forward. Of course, the pharmaceutical lobby is very strong and they want to persevere and restrict and focus on current treatments, current methods. But the future for us is better with preventive health care. So there is positive movement from every direction. So tech companies are starting to move to preventive health care, even though they're not the experts, but they're starting to move in that direction. Google has made the eyeglasses and they're putting it forward to detect heart disease in the next five years. So it's not that if pharmaceutical restricts, other lobbies will not move in the positive direction. So that's where there's a merger in a lot of different spaces and sectors where you can move into any space if you get the right data. So Google got a lot of data from many different entities to build that. And now just seeing your eyes, I can tell you if you'll get a heart attack in five years. Uh, Germany has started uh, some sort of uh, longitudinal data-based preventive health system, which is happening at a government scale, because there are policies that ensure the data has to go to government. And the government kind of has this data accessible to researchers to build these technologies. So it's starting to happen at scales that are smaller than the world, but it's starting to happen. And if these small starts have happened where countries have started adapting, building their models, uh, that means that it would be there globally accessible very soon. India is at a very early stage because of no data collected at that stage, but definitely Europe has shown the way with a lot of preventive aspects coming through. Because uh, to build a preventive algorithm, you need to have the data that's in time series, which means the start, how you were 10 years ago, how you are nine years ago, how you are eight years ago. And okay, if you've got a heart disease now, we need to understand how your blood levels were, how your eyes were, and other parameters. That's how AI understands. It's just like us. It's not very different. It needs that data, it needs that precursor history. And that's where I think Europe has been very positive in that direction and promoting new innovation. So that's somewhere it's coming in and it will come in bottom up. Uh, yes, sir. Um, 
Thank you. Uh, I, I think I have a question on what are the structure. So, for example, you give an example of rural India. Yeah. For example, if you need to be a doctor, they can do a surgery in rural India. I think you need to have certain infrastructure, that you need internet and all the equipment and yeah. skill set. So that's my one question: is what are the infrastructure that needed to happen that sort of, you know, connection or revolution? Second point: that do you believe that the lack of infrastructure, technology? or knowledge uh, or skill set will lead to any planet uh, in, in developing countries because as you see that a lot of problems in those countries is not just the lack of knowledge per se or the skill set, but also I think resources that needed, the infrastructure that they need to build. So I feel like that revolution that we're talking is great. I mean, it's gonna benefit certain part of the world, but not a lot of people in developing countries. So how do you see that? Is going to affect this revolution, or you know, good question. A very, a very important question because good we, question. when we talk about the SDGs, uh, I think a lot of those problems related to poverty, illiteracy. I think you, you mentioned the progress that they are not, unable to go to school now, right? To learn these skills. So, how are you going to bridge uh, that the issue of infrastructure development? In rural part of the world, in developing countries, also bringing them that technology, uh, and I feel like it's going to take a very long time to solve that problem. So I just wanted to give a very question. good question. Um, if we need to create the same infrastructure as currently exists, what US is using the robots that sell at two million minimum and go forward for robotic surgery, or we go to other equipment, it will take time. It'll be difficult, but every country can innovate their own and start building their own, given the knowledge, innovation, mindset. In rural, you'll be surprised at what technologies India are building, given the right knowledge and skill sets and direction. Uh, they can start building their own solutions. And once innovation starts from every household and every location, uh, these problems will stop to exist. And this is the only way to ensure equitable SDG, in my opinion. Of course, there might be multiple ways that other people can think of. But if we give the knowledge to the people, they know their problems better. And if they know solutions that are happening globally, how those solutions are being built, they can internally start building. I mean, ISRO started from you know not having much data, but they put a rover on the moon, and that's a big achievement. And uh, similarly, being India, it's a huge achievement. And if we see, if we can put a, a rover on the moon, there are other technologies, robotics, all this that can be built given the right knowledge. And yeah, I just add the gentleman's comment. Yeah, this is my opinion. Yeah. Uh, I think there are levels of AI solutions and technologies to deploy. And right now we're talking about complicated solutions that requires probably $500,000 to invest on GPUs, probably more. Uh, but did you know that probably 70% of AI solutions can be done by a simple laptop, simple machine learning, you know, supervised, unsupervised. So to answer your question, and it's my humble opinion that a simple laptop like this once you install all the right softwares and systems you need in Python and all the libraries with Excel sheet, let's say I go to a farmland in Kazakhstan or the Philippines, I start collecting data. And let's say one year later, I have 365 data points. You can just run simple machine learning algorithms with labels and start helping farmers that way as well. So to answer your question, I think the infrastructure required is a simple thing as a laptop and a knob. And then speaking of knowledge, again, it's my opinion that it just requires a few hours a week. And in six months, you'll all know how to make your own supervised, unsupervised models. There's a lot of data out there. There's even YouTube guides step-by-step -step on how to do that. So I think what you're bringing us is the awareness, right? And these discussions are good because uh, we need to demystify the complexities of AI because I, I believe what, what's happening now is we're all getting uh, the, the illusion or the understanding that only super rich corporations can do it, but actually each and every one of you here in six months can start building your own models. You just need a laptop, right? So something to consider, just good for thought. And you don't need uh, Python either, right? AI can do Python. There's a new course that's launched. I was telling someone that AI for Python. Yeah. So AI can write Python. You just have to know how to talk to the computer. It's like having an assistant. You talk to the assistant correctly, it will make the right product for you. It's like how you would talk to an engineer, build me this product, and AI can build it for you. 
So in the future, it's not difficult to build. Of course, maybe that level of a system we might not be able to build, but a proof of concept that can be guided to engineers to build it will reduce the investment to build the solution because we know exactly what's needed. Being able to have the right data is going to be our USP. Uh, the reason Elon Musk's new AI, Google's new AI is not competing with ChatGPT is data and model complexity. So that is where AI has an advantage. Once you're first, you're first for a long time to come. Because getting that level of intelligence, getting that level of data is not software development. It's not straightforward. It's not a process. It's research. And that is where big USP can be unlocked at developing country level as well. Because your data is actually, like the, many people have said that data is a new oil. But what does it actually mean is very crucial. That data powers these algorithms. They power this new AI. Now in Colombia, I had a friend, a part of the, the government there. Um, so she was telling me that Google approached us. They said, why don't you provide us your data on the, the brain scans? Uh, we'll give you first rights to the software once it's created. And uh, that's it. So she said, uh, the company said, no, <laughs> we'll use the data ourselves. And that's where people are starting to understand. In uh, India also, there's a 1MG couple of companies that are funded by Tata that have been approached to provide the data, we'll build the system, then you get you know, free use for one year. And that is where uh, with the data and with the AI knowledge, what 1MG told them is that you pay us $100 per data if you want it. If you don't, then we'll build it ourselves because we're anyway doing it. And that is where the mindset switching, that AI can be accessible, it can be built. You don't need the biggest servers. You don't need the best brains. You need the right algorithm, the right knowledge, the right data set to build it. And if you bring AI to the people, then innovations that even the big companies cannot imagine will be done because they have a better understanding of the problem, better understanding of the end user. Sitting in fancy offices in New York doesn't give you understanding of agricultural problems at scale. You have to go on ground, understand the farmers, which was something we were discussing about the education of the farmers and other things. So that is where empowering the rural educated class, the farmers, children that are studying in university, they will be great people to develop these solutions and they'll push boundaries and create new outcomes that we can only imagine. So I hope that answers your question. Yes, I think it does in a sense, but I mean, if we look at back, I mean, um, you know, where you're from, where you're from, people are, they, they like internet, which means that you can you know, access any, even like a micro learning board. I mean, they, they don't have electricity. They, are, they, they, they don't have clean water. Um, we are going and talking to them about it. Yeah, like of course, it does, but I mean, it requires a certain level of development. Exactly. No, that, that is true. Where, I mean, that's not my question, is that the infrastructure needs to be there. Yeah, basic uh, infrastructure. I mean, I mean, just going back to the comic books, you know, yeah. you, know, the, you know, you need one uh, computer to do all these things. Exactly. Uh, but I think when you talk about, uh, when you think about computer, if you don't have electricity, how are you going to run your computer? It makes sense. If you don't have internet, how are you going to access those data points? Right? So I think oh, that is the question that we need to ask. Um, and I think going back to the, my next question was the inequality. Do we believe that there is going to be inequality? That's going to further increase the inequality that is like between you know the city centers and the rural areas where the majority of people are living. Oh, exactly. Good point. Good point. Darling, solar power. <laughs> He's answered it the fastest <laughs> that could be done. So, so kudos to that. But um, I mean, if you have new solar power, you will not have problem. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. still, I mean, sitting in Geneva. So that's actually a bigger question that you've answered. Um, it's the, very different than when you go with a 100%. There's, that's a bigger systemic problem, and we'll need to take it as a full session and cover a lot of gaps, how we can address that. But I agree, some countries are, are there. India has accomplished a lot of electricity, rural, some levels of water, food, and all have reached everyone. So India has that, that scale to develop, but definitely I agree with you. Some countries do not have basic infrastructure to do it. Yes, I see that there's a very lively conversation here. <laughs> To uh, go for lunch at 12. Yes. Um, How much time do we have? At the one fifteen, so we need to get done for lunch. Yes. So we around 15 minutes or so. We have 15 minutes. So I'm just going to try to cover a few more slides <laughs> and then we'll, we'll have more conversation at lunch. Yeah. Hey, Tom, let's go to the next slide. Smart cities, sustainable cities. Uh, how do we ensure energy efficiency? That we use the right amount of energy for transport, for travel. 
uh, imagine a city that's optimized so that people are reaching their destination in the least amount of time every time, minimum time spent at traffic signals because they're all optimized to work according to your predicted schedules. How sustainable would that be? How much better would that be? That is AI. That is what AI can do. Even if we put our best minds together, it's almost impossible to make something continuously sustainable for the next 100 years. But with data on how populations have changed in regions, what people normally do in what locations, what are the best locations to have hospitals, what are the best locations to have schools, colleges, AI can actually plan an entire city map to be climate efficient, to ensure that we are having the minimal use of electricity where we don't need it and ensure everything is working according to a broader goal and plan that we've set. This is what AI brings us. Uh, next slide, I'm gonna to try to go faster. <laughs> Only have 15 minutes. Uh, peace, justice, strong institutions. Satellite can predict war, uh, like what we were saying, um, what uh, Nicole had mentioned. With satellite, we were able to detect movement of refugees and other details. Um, satellite can detect a lot of things. And with AI, it can detect even more. So there are a lot of different analysis at country levels that are happening with satellite on agriculture trends. What is growing, what is not growing? How are you able to analyze and predict climate, microclimate changes that are happening? Analyze warfare. What is the outcome of a war? What is happening? What stage is the damage at in buildings? Other things can be analyzed deeply. So this opens an entire another aspect of uh, you know, ensuring peace justice. And on the enforcement side, if police can predict crime, they know what sort of crime is gonna happen because there's a precursor to a crime. There are usually some parameters that repeatedly happen before a crime happens. And if AI is able to understand through the data for small crimes such as pickpocketing and other things, if the apt police force is there at that location at that time, that crime can be prevented. So that is another aspect of really optimizing our resources. Let's say we have 100,000 police officials. I'll give you a case study of uh, Haryana government, which we were working on is that uh, there are certain festivals, certain gatherings where, where some crimes happen. And if there are police officials present at that time, then that crime would not happen because the criminal would see their presence and not do it. So that is where bigger interventions are possible at that scale to optimize the placement of officers in evenings for women's security and other things. If we really place the staff well and optimize our usage, we're able to extract more value. So some things that even officers there mentioned was that if we track the 100 repeat criminals, they are the ones behind major kidnappings and other things. First time kidnappers are very rare. And if we really ensure we know their whereabouts, we're able to ensure safer, bigger transformation from our home security level. So different solutions work for different areas, but knowing that AI can do this and help in this is a very big positive. And of course, analyzing a crime scene, a lot of time crime scenes, uh, data is lost, bigger problems happen, data is not correct, uh, collected correctly. There are problems in that because we miss aspects, we type things wrong. Sometimes there are very big systems, like India's working on a big system uh, for collecting all the police data in all different cities, states, across all police places. But the biggest problem they have is the data is entered incorrectly. So they're starting with a base problem. And I want this analysis, but the data is wrong. Everyone has the same name in a particular location. <laughs> or they have similar problems. How do we get the outcome? So that is where intervention with AI creates bigger changes of validating the data at entry level, really ensuring that the right data is coming through to ensure the system has no problems in the future. So whenever planning new systems, I think that intervention is crucial. Uh, next slide, it's on. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I think he's lost the Wi-Fi. But essentially, <laughs> essentially, this is where I think every area um, you can really understand more, and uh, we're coming towards uh, closer to one area where I wanted to stop that. But the idea today was to really show you that AI can be used, is being used, and a lot of changes are being driven with AI. And if today we're not using it effectively in our role or what we are doing to achieve an SDG, we're actually missing out on many big advantages we can achieve, right from water monitoring, monitoring where the spillage is in different pipes, ensuring water security, to um, you know, many areas, whichever, monitoring life on land, monitoring life underwater, sustainable fishing. I believe Netherlands has been doing good work in that direction of monitoring the fish with sensors and being able to ensure that fishing is only done at the right proportions. And also fishing is more efficient so farmers get fish faster. And we ensure the population is preserved for sustainable fish farming. So these sort of innovations are coming through each and every area that you can imagine. And it's only possible if the data from these sensors 
all the data available is being processed using an AI, so we can achieve that outcome. So the idea is, if we're back on the slide, is to really urge you to start considering that AI is only a human brain. It needs data, and then we can deploy it at scale with the right team to be able to ensure we're getting the right outcome over back. Um, industry innovation, this is a small aspect of traffic, uh, of uh, sorry, of crack detection in um, the different manufacturing facilities. So it can detect very easily any defects in products. If you detect the defect early enough in a textile production or something, you reduce wastage, which is more sustainable. This is a very big aspect of application that's coming through almost every industry you can imagine. In uh, Mayo, in the college, in the school where we've set up our lab, a student is working on a similar model from the seventh grade where he's able to detect a faulty ice cream cone and ensure that the fault stops when it's made the problem. So he'll be recognized at the school level, getting an award, even maybe a country level, where he would have done that innovation through applied, uh, through applied AI and making the right application. Um, similarly, if you see the metaverse and repairing equipment, learning how to repair equipment by doing the right tasks is something that can really transform their learning, their outcomes. And our ability to train people just by words, by presentation, by video is very limited. People have reached a stage where attention has become very less because of social media, courtesy Zuckerberg and other people. But uh, people's attention spans have gone down. So to cater to learning in such a context where everyone wants to see their phone in every five minutes is uh, applied uh, learning or experiential learning where we make them do the task. And that's one thing we're actually pioneering at uh, one of the universities in uh, India, where uh, we're making the education system for medical more doing-based learning. So students start learning through the metaverse, do different sort of surgeries, practical aspects, and build skill through these systems so teachers can focus on broader learning and ensuring that students have a certain level of hand-eye coordination, being able to really, for example, if you're working as a dentist, you need the, the leg hand coordination to press um, the, the toggle at the bottom and use the utensils correctly. So that is something that uh, is being brought through the metaverse where multiple students can see the teacher doing that and then they can do it themselves on the same equipment, same patient. And if they do something wrong, let's say they, they cut too deep in the enamel or dentine, uh, then there's an alarm raised where the student without making damage to a patient or to a practical aspect is able to understand there's a mistake and redo the process and be graded on that without teachers having to do it again and again and again. So that ensures a better average quality of students. And that is something that's coming in a big way in the education space and ensuring the right training is done. Of course, in defense, we're able to capture border areas and bring it to the training room. But when you're trained on warfare or border protection, you actually know where you're going to be and you know what sort of activity goes on. So you're trained on various disaster scenarios, how to handle different events that can arise right from being in the metaverse. So these sort of applications are now becoming omnipresent. And without them, the level of outcome we achieve in training and with them, the level of outcome we achieve is significantly better because they've actually done the practice. So they have muscle memory, they have knowledge of, oh, I did this wrong, that's what happened. So next time I'll not make that mistake. So these sort of benefits are coming in, which are making people more apt to be able to accomplish certain roles. So in this world of AI, innovation change is persistent but it starts from a base level of thinking where the brain comes first and building the different changes is crucial. Our understanding of ourselves will be at a much deeper level. Our understanding of physics will be at a much deeper level. Our understanding of the universe will be at a much deeper level. Actually, I was reading something today that uh, the scientists are trying to now capture the parameters that model the universe through AI. So we could not understand the universe on our own and the multiple galaxy that exists. But with the AI, they're able to understand the parameters that define a universe, how we would think of a physics equation having certain problems. They're creating those equations using AI and then testing real galaxies that they fit that sort of a solution. So our imagination is our only limitation right now. And any change that you can imagine can be done. No financial restriction, no other restriction exists because with AI, there are many people to back innovation, many people looking at new ideas, new funds. So social ventures are also stepping up in a large way. A lot of investors we met in India are looking for good products, good solutions in AI. So that can also really power the growth in rural in a lot of places. And bringing the right knowledge can only take us forward for the better. So are we at 12? Three minutes more. Three minutes. So three minutes will invite uh, some questions. <laughs> Sir, your question. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
This is my second time coming here. The first day when I come here, I have a headache. <laughs> <laughs> first, I'm very poor in English. I speak English. So when I come out to study, I try to understand the words. Certainly, I ask my friends who are good in French. Thank you, my friends. <laughs> in the second, every day when I'm listening to people of that country, I do the switch. I'm asking because in my country, too, the government is, is clear. You know where he went to. What can I? Take uh, an outcome, ask the diplomatic to do what we want as they are all around me. So help my country to come forward to that. So I don't know how much to congratulate and uh the second occasion that I I have two three small questions. So, the first of the question. Please, please, what's the place of the human being? <laughs> I'm posing this question because we are learning. We are an intelligent species. So, uh, uh, if I'm a bad person, I can lose it in a bad way. Mm -hmm. uh, the world is the world. It's you and depend on the world. Avoid this and as he said that science and conscience science without conscience is a of uh, human being. Second question our countries, I'm a diplomat, I'm government, we have a question what's the place of basketball in the basketball in the government? Maybe the base is not. Who guarantee us that is they are secure? And this we must try probably one day. I wonder if the head of state will pose me the question. Try to give them an answer, to give them confidence, so to open their eyes to support what the world where the world is going. The second the third question. Um, suppose that you are called. By my president, for his medicine. He asked a young man, I want to be the best. My country, I want my best, my country to be the best in here. From which can I start? From where can I start to have a strong policy and to succeed in my policy? So a lot of my poses questions. And I appreciate that question. Oh, very and good. I have had one three small Thank you, all of you. Excuse me, I'm my interest in that. Very good. <laughs> very good. We'll get you then. Really. Great questions. And uh, definitely, I'll probably also address the, the third question first, since that adds a, a big new perspective to what we've already been discussing. It's from a political landscape. AI brings economic growth new startups forming, new technology coming, jobs, if we're not having jobs, those start forming, food for all, ensuring agriculture is correct, getting more output, health for all, ensuring the right well-being for everyone. This has very big political aspects as well. And that government knows better than us how to market it, but essentially it is doing better for the nation. When people benefit, country benefits, they recognize the leader bringing the benefit. And that is something that is good from that context. Human's role. We have always designed the human role. When Chad GPT came in, we designed prompt engineer as the role of human. So there will always be new roles of humans coming in to manage the AI systems, ensure they're working correctly, ensure the data is unbiased, which we were already discussing, and ensure the systems are working effectively. There are no problems in its working and deployment. 
ensuring that the system never fails, like what happened with Microsoft and CrowdStrike, um, ensuring the working at every time. So that aspect is where human roles are forming, right? From AI manager to AI doctor to data manager of AI to ensuring AI systems testings are happening correctly, to ensure AI system certification are happening. So it's basically what currently technology is driving our ecosystem, right? Everything's on computer, database, here, there, we're using it. And if we take out technology right now, our elements would collapse, not be able to work as well, mostly. Um, so the idea here is that AI will be replacing that. There will be AI coming in and there'll be all the roles around that managing that will be forming. And that will give us as humans at the bottom level more power. We will have the ability to use AI to achieve whatever outcome we want. I have a farmland. I want to grow uh, you know, potatoes or, or I want to grow whatever I want here. I can do that. I can genetically engineer seeds and ensure they work in my land condition. This is a future we're talking about. So there's no land that's barren. There's no land that will have problems. We can um, engineer essential minimal use of water by agriculture. We can ensure that livestock does not get sick through genetic engineering and predicting diseases. Um, we can ensure many things that really take the nation forward and help us not deal with current problems. We deal with new problems that arise, but the current problems which are systemic and causing us loss in business value, bigger problems, those stop existing. This is what is progress. This is what is moving us forward. Earlier, we had problems of uh, dengue and malaria where a lot of people died, we got new drugs that solved those problems. It created new problems with side effects and other things, but now we're dealing with those problems. So similarly, we keep moving forward. When the plastic was invented, people were so happy. You know, even in rain, it never gets wet. And now it's become a very big problem in landfill and waste. So new problems get created based on our understanding of the universe, but AI is this positive that can help us combat those problems better. It is that friend of ours that can understand all this data for us. So we focus on direction, thinking, critical thinking with all roles being aligned to work with that system. When there was a calculator, people thought this is the best invention, we'll always be using the calculator. But then came computer, then came AI, and calculators became a part of that. So that is where uh, the innovation has changed the way of working. And that way of working is better for everyone. Accessibility of food, water, everything will change now with time. So that is where I think the adaptation is crucial. And making the right changes now is crucial. And education is the biggest contribution to building the nation. Once people know the contribution and the ability, they can really take the entire country forward. There's a, one thing I emphasized earlier and will emphasize now is the problem understanding is much better within the country and understanding of what solution will work is much better in the country. Bringing the knowledge of AI to our people in the country can really help it reach outcomes faster because we are not testing and trying. We're actually knowing what we want. We just need to achieve that with data health. And that is a very big statement of how a lot of countries can start developing solutions. And if the solution works for you, you can export it. But other people also need help. They might not have the data. They might not have as many people working on that problem. So that becomes a globally collaborative society where everyone starts solving problems and bringing innovation, which is the only way out in the future. And recently, I'd read an article that the only way to combat this recession, which has come globally, is AI and innovation. And that is what is going to change the entire employment dynamics and a lot of dynamics that exist globally. Because if we don't change, the world is already changing. In India, Reliance recently fired 42,000 people, and we have 150,000 people out of work in the last six months. And IITs are not able to place 40% of students. The IITs are like our Stanford and Harvard. It's like the top institutions in India. They're not able to place 40% of students according to media articles and RTIs. And the reason is that Python and coding is not as relevant now. I need people that can go beyond, understand systems and design them. And as companies, I don't need an army of developers. I need an army of thinkers that will be able to really research, create the right solutions for me. So that is critical. Michael, is it the alarm? OK, <laughs> it is the alarm. And I look forward to discussing more at lunch. I hope the session was insightful, gave you good uh, ideas. Uh, the idea was to open your mind, show you the perspective, what's possible and really invite you to start incorporating AI in your thinking, which will incorporate it in your strategy. The next few slides we had were to really show you how to make a strategy and really move forward in that direction, how you incorporate it actually hands-on and make you also work on thinking about how 
AI is working for different problems in your area of work because you know your problems better than me. And being able to see how AI can apply to them, we wanted to have an interactive session where you would actually write down some certain problems and then we'd go on looking at solutions for them. But that is to next time, Mihoko. <laughs> you don't know. I was going to get a certificate. Okay. Well, thank you so, so much, Bedan. Very, very exciting, very interesting discussion. Um, uh, so uh, part one finished now, but we will have part two, which is uh, happening in the afternoon. So we have two panel discussions, and I'm sure, including myself, after absorbing lots of listening, lots of information from Bedan and all the, all the participants here, you have lots of thoughts and lots of questions, yeah. including mm -hmm. myself. So uh, in the afternoon, we have plenty of opportunities to ask questions, also listen from other experts. Uh, so please stay, uh, and certificate will come at the end of the <laughs> afternoon session, I believe. After the survey, yes. <laughs>